Welcome, investigator. Evil is on the rise. Crime is escalating. Our mission is to eliminate the crime by exposing evil, examine why it manifests, and highlight the brave souls that confront it every day. Join us as we work together to bring justice to every victim. Welcome to All Things Crime. Here's your host, Jared Bradley. Hey, everybody. It's Jared. Welcome back to another episode of All Things Crime. Appreciate you subscribing and hitting that bell for so you never miss an episode. You're definitely going to want to not only uh, watch, you know, every episode that that we talk about today, but every, you know, we have so much good stuff out there. We're talking about everything from OJ Simpson all the way to cold cases. And um, yeah, but this morning I have a couple of gentlemen here that these guys are renowned for being friendly and being um, exceptionally, well, they never, they never speak their minds, especially being from New York. So I, I just want to welcome Tom Smith and Dan Murphy from the Gold Shields podcast. So, you know, while we're here, make sure to swing over to, you know, when the show's over, of course, not right now, but um, go over and uh, subscribe to the Gold Shields. So these guys are um, retired NYPD detectives, so you know that it's going to be an amazing show. So guys, welcome. Thank you so much, Jared. Thank you. Yeah, it's an honor to be here with you. Thank you. It was great meeting you recently, too. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. So I uh, just give everybody a little history. Uh, we were down in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, which is always a treat, at least it, it, when it's not in the middle of summer, right? Yep. <laughs> and we were at the National Law Enforcement Officer Hall of Fame uh, induction ceremony. And Tom, you know, congratulations again for that Lifetime Achievement Award. And I definitely want to talk about that for a little bit. But man, what a great ceremony that was. The music was amazing. In fact, I've kind of reached out. What's that? Dale? Dave, Dave Ray. Ray. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Man, that he, he can sing. Mm -hmm. yeah. He is really, really good. So I've actually, uh, my sister and my brother-in-law run this, uh, it's called Highway 30 Music Fest. And it's like a four-day festival. It started in Idaho, where I grew up, by the way, Dan. That's, um, you know, you said you had that little stint in Boise. Mm -hmm. I grew up about an hour and a half east of there. So, but anyway, my, my sister and, and brother-in-law run this music fest called Highway 30, and I referred, referred him to them. So hopefully they can get, get them together. And it's just four, four days of just rocking nonstop music for, I, I think they start at like 10 or 11 in the morning and go till midnight and wow. it's just endless bands. Yeah. If you guys like music and, um, it, it's kind of a mix between country and, They've got all sorts of, you know, all the way to hard rock. So good stuff. Anyway, that's a little tangent there for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with true crime, but. Where do they um, hold that festival? Where is that, Jared? Well, there, there's two of them now, actually. There's one that's in uh, the Fort Worth area that I think is in October. And then the one up in Filer, Idaho is in June. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's coming up quick. So if you guys are um, or, or anybody out there. Highway 30 Music Fest. It's yeah. We, I went last year for the first time. They've they've been doing this ten years now. So this will be their eleventh year. And man, it's uh, it's a fun time. It's a really fun time. So very cool. Yeah. Well, guys. So we met down in Fort Worth, and you were down there being basically honored, Tom and and Dan. I know you're right alongside him. You've also received uh, awards from the the hall of fame right no i'm not a hall of fame member no i'm not nearly as important as tom <laughs> tom is uh tom's a guy that's had a real career me i just i sat in offices i wrote you know i wrote a lot of good reports i was really good report writer as a cop that's all i did i wrote a couple you know of tickets what? once i wrote a couple of tickets once i got a story about that boy it was harrowing yeah yeah that yeah ticket. lucky i survived it yep yeah that broken tail light <laughs> The one time his pen didn't run out of ink while he was yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it worked out. No, listen, Dan, you know, Dan is humble as, as anyone I know. His career is amazing. The cases that he worked on, you know, we did a couple of shows once. We highlighted a case each that we did on Gold Shields because, you know, we focused on our guests, but we said, you know what, Let, let's do this. And he told a story about a kidnapping murder case, the King of Clubs case that he ran 
that I've heard numerous times. And when I hear it, I still get a chill and a, oh my God, of what he did. And I would love to, you know, have you just do a show on that because that show is, the uh, case is incredible. Well, but, shoot, you know, Tom, you know, that's, a, that's the teaser of the day right there. Okay. Dan, why don't, why don't you just give us the gist of that case? Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Tom. First of all, I, I appreciate that you guys would find the case interesting. It's it, Please understand, it's a group effort. I worked with a lot of people on this case, and I, I did a lot of work on it, yes. And I was very proud of the outcome on behalf of the victims, but it, it, it's a group effort. And every, you know, Anybody who works any kind of investigative cases will tell you, very rare is the one that you do alone. And this is one that was a, a big group effort. This specific case was... When I was in the major case squad as detective, one of our basic mandates was any ransom kidnapping in New York City we handled. Unless it was reported to the FBI, it was our purview, no matter where in the city it was. So we were citywide. We had a, a period of time in the 90s when I was there where we were averaging 55 to 60 kidnappings for ransom a year. Now, that may sound like a lot to people. That's, that is a lot. And, and they are busy complex cases and individuals being held against their will duct taped beaten raped deprived of food their families being pressured to, to family and loved ones pressure to come up with ransom and certain ethnic communities within the city tended to have a rash of them the i'll call it illegal alien chinese world of alien smuggling in new york city of human trafficking was rife for this and the individuals that were preying on these poor people were the people who were also making money off them by extorting their businesses by charging them exorbitant amounts of money to come here. It was really, really a tough time to be a very poor person trying to make it in America from China. So we had one specific case. We worked so many of them, but we had one specific case that started with two separate kidnappings being reported to us. So two separate detectives each had the case of a family calling and saying, we don't have the money for ransom. We have to come to the police. Our loved one has been taken by somebody. And there was not much more information because there was no information coming into the family in America. So the cases were stagnant for a couple of days. It was nothing to work off of. We didn't know where the victim was. We didn't know much about it at all. I actually remember going away for Labor Day weekend. It was 1995, Labor Day weekend. Went away with my family out to the eastern end of Long Island to Montauk with some friends. And this is the time before cell phones being prevalent and beepers were the thing. And so I had a beeper. And it was not uncommon to get beeped in the middle of the night or whatever. As a kidnapping, come in, you're up. But I remember being out there for the weekend, and it's, I think, Sunday or Monday, driving back in, because I lived on the other end. I lived up near West Point. So driving back in with my family, as soon as I get into beeper range, my beeper is going off like crazy. And it's call the office, 911, right away. You know, I find a pay phone. This is the era of pay phones. I call the office. I find out that everything blew up. Everything blew up. And here's what happened in a nutshell. It turns out that one specific offshoot of what's called the Fukunese Flying Dragons, which was a newer, more violent group of flying dragons that had come from the Fujian province of China than the traditional American-born Chinese flying dragons in Chinatown, if that makes any sense. They were the more violent upstart group. They, an offshoot of them, had done three kidnappings, our two and another one. And they were holding all three of these individuals together in a basement apartment in the Borough Park section of Brooklyn. They're holding them and they're calling the family for ransom and they're calling China because they're calling family in China so that their cohorts in China can go meet these guys and pay them the ransom there. So that way we don't arrest them at a ransom drop, which was very common. We were almost batting a thousand. If you ask for a ransom, and you, you had to expose yourself to show up to get it, we would grab you, and the case would be closed. Free the victim, all that stuff. We were pretty good at it. Well, turns out that these guys, these gang members who were abusing these two females and one male for three days and making them do unspeakable things I will not say on, on any family type of show, uh, just horrific abuse they put these people through. One of the family members flat out said, one of the women, her family said, they just don't have the money. Well, that was a death sentence for her. They decided to kill her several different ways. They crushed her skull in with a television set. They slit her throat. They strangled her, and they tied a plastic bag around her head 
so she couldn't get any air. And then they hung her from a weight bench. They had like this exercise bench. They hung her from it, dead. And this is in a small apartment. And on the floor right next to her is another female victim who they wrapped up in duct tape like a cocoon. She couldn't move. They took the guy that they had and they said, okay, to the woman that's alive, we're going to go out now. We're going to go partying. We're going to shoot him and kill him. We're going to go partying. We're going to come back. See the clock? In a few hours at this time, we're going to come back and kill you. So they leave. She realizes, I have to do something or I'm dead. These guys obviously are killers. I got the proof six inches away from me. So she manages to worm her body in such a way that she moves and she gets herself over to a stove, manages to get her head up and with her teeth turns on the stove and gets a flame. She then manages to go over and get a newspaper because they're all reading the Chinese newspapers. They all want to see if there's any coverage of that, this kidnapping and all this stuff. And she takes the newspaper and throws it on top and it starts a small fire. But it's enough for the smoke to go out through an open window and alert people in the neighborhood there's fire in the basement. 911 call comes in, the fire department breaks in, in through the smoke they see the crime scene. Police get called. At the same time, about a half an hour drive away at the Nassau County Queens border, these perpetrators had the male victim in the car. They pulled off a highway and they just pulled off like onto the side of the road and brought this guy down a ravine and shot him in the head. Problem is the bullet hit his cranial, traveled around, didn't enter, didn't kill him, gave him a concussion, gave him a big headache, but didn't kill him. So they left thinking he's dead. He wakes up dazed, walks out into traffic and causes a multi-vehicle accident without getting killed, which is a miracle. Mm. All this starts to unfold. The first arriving cops, interpreters, what happened? I was kidnapped. Where? I was in Brooklyn with this and that. As soon as they say I was kidnapped, they call our squad because we hadn't law kidnappings. We got a guy here who says he was, yeah, we have a case on him. And they go, same thing in Brooklyn. This looks like a kidnapping situation. The woman says we were held, all this stuff. Everything starts unraveling. I get told, you know, get your butt out to Long Island Jewish Hospital now because I was doing a RICO case on the Fukunese Flying Dragons at the time. And I had hundreds of photographs of known members of the gang, associates, all of it. And I had a reasonably encyclopedic knowledge of who they were and what they did and how they did it, where they hung out, all that stuff. So I go to the hospital. I start showing this guy. He's a bit of a mess. He identifies one person who, turned, as it turns out, was a, an informant of mine who wasn't involved, but I brought him in anyway. Make a long story short, we start a full throttle investigation in conjunction with Detective Squad, Brooklyn South Homicide Squad, and the Major K Squad. We're going to find these guys. What they did, though, to the woman they killed in a little bit of a way of giving us the finger was they, they wrote on a note in Chinese, you'll never catch us, the white devil, us, you're, you're not smart enough, we'll out trick you, we'll do what we want kind of thing. They took a king of clubs playing card and that note stuffed it down her shirt, her blood soaked shirt, and it was found. Well, the local newspapers picked up on this and it became the king of clubs murder. Now, they said in their note that the king of clubs, the club itself, was a key to their identity, a clue. It turned out they called themselves the Plum Flower Boys. And Plum Flowers apparently looked like a club on a playing club. We didn't. We figured this out because we had some Chinese detectives that we worked with who were pretty knowledgeable in the language, etc. And so now we had an idea what the crew called itself. Didn't have full IDs on any of them, though. I had never heard of them before. So we're working our tails off for days trying to figure out crime scene evidence, trying to go through numbers and information. And then we get a call from the FBI in Seattle. Turns out that when they grabbed these, these when, when our perps grabbed the victims, at the same time in Seattle, the FBI had a case reported to them. Chinese case, victims grabbed, same similar circumstances in MO. And at the time, there was a thing called international calling cards. If you had an AT&T calling card, you had like a 16 or it was like a VIN number. And that was unique to your account. And you could put $100 on the card and you could call anywhere around the world and it would give you whatever time it gave you. These guys used the same calling card numbers in New York and Seattle to call victims' families in China. The FBI had figured that out by tracing the numbers and they saw there was calls to New York. And we said, yeah, we have a kidnapping too. <clears throat> so we know our crews are related. They had made two arrests out in Seattle. Myself and another detective, our captain, looks at us and goes, what are you doing here? 
And that's how the MIPD works. Why aren't you on a plane right now going to Seattle? So we took off with the clothes on our back to the airport, flew out to Seattle, managed to talk to the FBI out there and get a chance to talk to these two individuals in the federal lockup. They didn't give us much, but it was a place to start. We come back, and it's no more than a day or two later of additional investigation before a detective named Bill Oldham, who I worked with, who was very, very well-versed in the Asian crime world, he looks at me and he goes, they're in L.A. I said, how do you know they're in L.A.? He goes, they're in L.A. That was by Bill's way. I said, okay, how do you know they're in L.A.? They're in my snitch's apartment. He had informants everywhere. He had an informant that was living in L.A. that these guys beat feet out of New York and went to L.A. because of the heavy press on the case, and they're staying in the form informant's apartment. They're bragging about the case the whole bit. So, again, my captain looks at us with that same look. What are you doing here? Back you let you on go a plane. change clothes first? Or? Oh, well, yeah, I actually had uh, Joe Pereno, was a sergeant, great guy, actually met me at the airport with a bag from my wife. It was crazy. It was like a baton relay. Here's a bag with some fresh underwear and jeans and stuff. Just go. So we literally jumped on a plane, flew out to L.A. In the middle of the night, we started our investigation with the local cops. We walk into, I think it was the Monterey Park Police Department, about 3 o'clock in the morning. And, we're, you know, we haven't slept four hours a night for the past five or six nights. And we look at the desk lieutenant and go, he goes, who are you guys? We tell him, he goes, what, what are you doing here? We tell him, he goes, really? Yeah, we're looking for a bunch of killers out here. And we figured we'd start here. <laughs> so that, basically, we spent the next several days running down every lead we could until we got information. They had left the snitch's apartment. They went someplace else. We ended up finding them. We get to this apartment, and it's a little Melrose Place style apartment, like those California with the pool in the middle and everything looks like it looks like a motel, right? You walk up, everything's open air. These guys are staying in, in this little place. And uh, we go there with, I think it's the uh, L.A. County Sheriff's. And they were great. They backed us up like crazy. And we went there and basically knocked on a door and of this apartment. And all we hear out the back window is crash. One guy jumps through the window to get out of the apartment desperately, falls into a tree, hits the ground, compound fracture of his leg. The uh, it was a third story apartment. The L.A. sheriff's guys grab him. The other guy's not opening the door. We put a foot through the door, and this guy's sitting on the floor. There's there's two guys in the apartment. There was a total of five perps, only two in the apartment. This guy's sitting on the floor, looking at all the ID of all 17 victims that they had ever done this to. They kept their ID, which gave us a roadmap for prosecuting them for all 17 kidnappings, which is what we did. But this guy's got them all laid out on the floor. I come through the door. Now, I haven't slept much. I'm 6'2", 6'3". At the time, I was about 2'10". I was pissed. I'm like, I haven't been home. And this guy gets up, and he does, like, the crane. You ever see that from, from the a karate kid? He does, like, the kung fu stance. <laughs> He's about 5'4", 120 pounds. He's going to kung fu me. It didn't work. Oddly enough, my size worked in my favor. So we, we arrest these two knuckleheads. We bring in all this evidence, and now we know we got three missing. There's hot food on the stove. There's clothes for other people. We just missed those guys. Turns out later on we found out they drove by and saw all our cars. They went out to get booze and cigarettes, and they left these two guys there, and they saw it, and then they beat feet. They took off. So now we got to get the other three. How do we get them? We start looking through beepers. We start looking through little black books, information pads. We get all this information. We figure out a number that looks, based upon everything we know about looking at how they categorize numbers in their phone and everything, this looks like a good one. So we set up a dummy number. We had our technical assistance response unit, which at the time was great, and they still are great with phones, set up a dummy phone number with a Chinatown, New York extension so that any call that came into it, we'd immediately dump and trace to, to wherever it came from. We start beeping these numbers, and we put in the codes, 888-911-888. Eight is good luck, fortune, financially, in their world, 911 immediately, and that's what these gang members did. When they had money to be made right away, call that number right away. They called back, and they called back from the Super 8, again, Super 8, lucky number, motel in a city called Milpitas, California, outside San Jose which was a several-hour flight north, 400 and something miles. So next thing you know, we're on a commuter flight at like 6.30 in the morning up there. Milpitas Police Department is surrounding this hotel. 
Long story short, we end up getting into the hotel and grabbing these these three guys. One of them ran to the back, into the bathroom, closed the door, and I, I, I just I still laugh about that. You got like twenty heavily armed SWAT guys hitting your door, and you run into the back bathroom to hide. You know, it's funny what people do when they're under pressure. But we ended up charging these guys with all seventeen kidnappings with the homicide everything it all went to f- through federal court the authorities out there were great but it was it was a memorable case i was flying home i was so tired i hadn't been home i get on a plane and i'm sitting there and i'm reading the new york times did a very accurate our, our public information folks did a very accurate job of recording for the media what the case was and how it went down and i was reading it it was very satisfying and i thought to myself you know This is what being a a detective really is. It's speaking for those who can't. It's looking at the way that they brutalize these people and getting justice for them. And I was just proud to have been a part of that. My small part of it was something that to this day, I still feel good that I was, it was an honor to be a part of in this savagery and evil in the world. And that was an example of it. Wow. What an incredible story, man. I mean, congratulations to everybody that was part of that, mm-hmm. you know, being able to bring down, I mean, I, the amazing thing about it, I, I was never a cop, but I was, I was in the military for a bunch of years. And so, you know, I, I have the same kind of camaraderie with, you know, other members of the military. Like I was just this week, I was down in Camp Pendleton and hanging out with some NCIS guys. And though, even though I was army, he, you know, the, one of the guys was a, a Marine you know, we still have that. And so I, I'm sure you guys feel that exact same way when, even though you were NYPD working with LA County Sheriff or any other, you know, law enforcement, and it doesn't matter where it is anywhere in the world, you have a camaraderie, an immediate amount of trust. And, and, you know, you you have a, you have a mission in life and that is to get scumbags like these, these, you know, guys off the street and, the, the thing that I, I think so many people don't fully understand is the level of depravity that's out there that, that especially you guys are dealing with. It's like, I, and, and it, I mean, partially Dan, I, I want to hear what happened to these victims, but on the other, on the other hand, I fully understand that, you know, you can't make this an X-rated, you know, podcast because that's basically the level that we'd be describing because it's the things that these guys will do to another human being is so inhuman. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know how else to, to yeah. explain it. And it's, but that, that's just something every, every cop that I talk to the the level of just sewer that they deal with is it's hard to comprehend. And, and, but until you do comprehend that, then you, you don't you don't fully understand the level of PTSD and the memories and all the things that you guys have seen. And, you know, just honestly, I, I my hat's off to you because your ability to even compartmentalize that and deal with it and still be a functioning human being is is superhuman, to be honest. And that's that's another reason I, I'm so I love working with law enforcement because you guys are just a different breed. And you're, you're special in your own way. And frankly, I don't, you you just don't get enough accolades and thanks from the general society because the stuff that you guys do in order to keep the rest of us safe is just superhuman. And I, I, first of all, thank you for what you've done and what you continue to do. And, and, but yeah, I appreciate you giving that story, man. Oh, my pleasure. So this Tom, guy's got stories. This yeah, <laughs> Tom. Um, you know the little bit that I heard when we were down there at the uh, induction ceremony. You know, even your that last stint in Afghanistan. I, I thought that was an amazing story. And first, before we before I have you um, tell us a little bit about that, I have to say, man, the the tribute you gave to your wife while you were up there on stage, I thought was one of the one of the coolest things I've ever heard. And, you know, sitting there at the table with her, she was just about in tears. I'm sure you, you you couldn't see her from when you were up there on the stage, but man, what a, what an amazing moment. And I think that kind of is kind of the same for all, 
law enforcement spouses, whether it's male or female. And it's same with military <laughs> spouses, you know, and, and that's, that's really what I can relate with. But yeah, your wife is obviously a special woman. Mm -hmm. And I thought the tribute you gave her was just absolutely fantastic. So well, um, thank you for that. You know, that was a, you know, when, when you're coming up with trying to figure a speech out and you're going over your career and it's impossible to culminate everything into a speech, you know, of, you know, what I had the fortune of going through. But then I thought that through everything I was thinking of, she was there too. You know, with every story, like I set up on the stage, every every story Dan mentioned in his speech, she was part of, whether it was after it, whether it was during it or whatever. And I just, I felt it important for the time that we've been together and what she's had to go through. And a lot, I don't know what she went through. You know, I, I was somewhere else doing something. She was home by herself or with the kids, you know, so I don't really know everything she went through but i know she stayed and <laughs> and you know we're together going on 35 years now and and what she's gone through i i just felt i had to i had to do it and and i got asked by someone about a week or so ago what was the best part of the night and i said well we were fortunate enough to when we were going up on stage to get our awards and to get inducted we all got standing ovations which was the best thing in the world. What a feeling that is. But then I said, the only other person that night, other than an inductee to get a standing ovation was my wife. Mm. And that made everything special for that evening. Well, yeah. And I think absolutely she was deserving of the, the standing ovation herself, but I think she was also kind of a stand-in for all the, the oh, law yeah. enforcement spouses yeah, and, you know, guys like me that really have, have at least a glimpse of what you guys go through and what, you know, your families go through. Yeah. That's what makes me so appreciative of law enforcement in general, because I interviewed a, a good friend. His name's Lee Miller. I don't know if you've ever run into him, but he's one of the clinical psychologist types that, you know, PhDs and this guy, he, whenever you have a truly demented type of a case where you're looking at a victim that's been, you know, not only tied up and, and, you know, tortured and murdered, or, you know, raped, all the horrible things that humans can do to each other. And you have really no idea what the mentality of the type of person that could do that. Dr. Meller is the type that you call and you say, okay, I need help with this guy because this isn't your normal homicide here. So, but he was, he was talking about the interesting thing, what happens with crime in general is there's, there's an intersection that happens. So if you think about a horizontal line, he calls that the sewer. And it's basically all the, the, the blood and the carnage, the needles, the filth, you know, the, the circumstances you'll walk into an apartment and you're like, how can people possibly live mm -hmm. like this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, just the, just the disgusting stuff that, that officers see on a daily basis that they have to deal with. That's the sewer. He said, then he's, there's a vertical line and he calls that the abyss. And the abyss is kind of the why the why is kind of, well, when you, when somebody commits a crime, there's usually a motive behind it. And that that's, he said, that's where I live. Now, the, the problem with a lot of officers is they try to, as, as they're in the middle of that sewer trying to do their job and a, and a really heinous crime happens, they try to figure out the why. And sometimes there is no why. And so they'll go down into this rabbit hole and that's, that's the psychological part that they really can't deal with. And that, that leads to, again, the PTSD and all sorts of issues there. But when you guys as detectives are, are working a case, you kind of have to delve into that abyss 
Mm-hmm. And so I guess one of my questions was as seasoned detectives with all the stuff that you've seen, how many times have you had cases where they were just like what you were describing, Dan, uh, you know, they just torture and murder some poor girl and the, the why, you know, did you ever figure out the why, you know, other than just motivated for money, why would these guys do that? In that specific case, I can say honestly, and I think this is a kind of a, a general cop tendency. Sometimes you don't care about the why. Sometimes you just look at the crime and say, you know what? These guys are just brutal, savage. They did it because, you know, they want to gain status within the gang. They did it because this is what the gang does and they want to be in the gang. They value that belonging enough to do this. And that's pretty common in gangs. I value I am who I am is a member of this gang and I will do what I have to do here. I'll do what I'm told to do. I'll do what makes money. I'll do whatever. And then you factor that in with maybe a culture that you come from where brutality or oppression is not a foreign thing to you. Maybe the government does it to you. Maybe you people that you, you know, surrounded by do it to you and others. There can be a variety of things. In that case, I didn't think about it. And partially, I think it's a defense mechanism, too, for cops and detectives. We want a separated wall between us and these people. Although as a detective, there's times when you have to delve into that why and you have to sit across from that person and you have to figure out mo- what's their motivation, why do they do it, so that you can get them to open up to you. And we do it in a manipulative way. It, it make no bones about it. It's not that I don't care about human beings, but I have a job to do. I have to get a statement from you. I have to get an uh, admission statement from you a confession of sorts, so that way I can close this case up, that I can nail the hammer shut, that you're going to get convicted. And I have to do that sometimes by sitting and telling you things like, of course she's put the knife in her neck. She disrespected you. Anybody would have done that. You have to realize why they did it. You have to play into that. You have to let them think that they are not a bad person. Tom, how many people Hmm. have you sat across from that no matter what they did will tell you, I'm not a bad person? Oh yeah. Of course you're not. Of course you're not. No, I understand you. As a matter of fact, I respect why you did what you did. You had to. Unfortunately, it's against the law. We'll figure that out. But man to man, I understand you. When you tell somebody that, it makes you want to go run and take a shower because you feel so disingenuous. But you do it for a greater cause. I need you to give me that statement. Yeah. And like Dan said, you know, in in my instances, you know, like he said, I never I never cared the why. What I did, though, was take mental notes of the why as you're doing your case. You know, you would hear a witness say something or a family member say something. You kind of tuck it away for exactly the reason Dan said, because then all those little mental notes come into play when you're doing the interrogation or the interview. That's when you bring them all out. But to focus on it, I always felt, you know, I have a goal and Dan will back this up. Get the bad guy. That's it. The, the why we'll figure out later on. Uh, you know, the, the number one priority is who did it, find them, lock them up. And then when you sit down and he's in a cell and you can pull all your mental notes together, witness statements and all that, then the why comes in. And then, like Dan said, then, you know, we, we both sat across the table from brutal, murdering, just diabolical people. And you have to, in a way, you put your arm around them and, you know, take them in and, okay, hey, I get it why you did this to this guy, you know, and and you just come up with, you know, reasons that you may not believe totally, but you know, it's going to work. You know, like Dan said, you're a great guy. No, you're not. You're a monster. But for right now, I need you to think you're a great guy. And that's when the mental part of, and that's experience. You know, that that just comes with, with years of experience and knowing what works. Dan and I talk numerous times about different interview techniques and all this. I mean, it didn't matter who I was going into interview or interrogate. I always started the conversation off with sports. I just, that was my thing. Hey, did you watch the Yankee game last night? And they'll look at you like, wait a minute, I just killed three people, but you want to talk to me about Derek Jeter? Yeah. And we do that for 20 minutes and took him totally off guard 
his plan of what he was going to say in the interview got thrown away. And then when I had that opening, then you start. There's a lot of psychology in police work. It's actually yeah. like a master's level degree after you've done enough time and dealt with enough people. You have to understand what, what a person's motivations are individually. Mm -hmm. Understanding the background, the deeper why, can be they were abused as a child. It can be that they witnessed homicides as a kid within their family or something crazy like that. That can be something that's deeper psychological. But the how do we get them to do what we need them to do? And sometimes it's drop a weapon, stop assaulting somebody, stop running, walk in and give themselves up. Whatever it is we need them to do, we're all about making it as peaceful and as easy as possible. Because what they've done has been done. It's documented. We have to figure out a way to get them into custody, get them to give us what we need so we can have a solid case, so we can close the case, present it to the DA, have it go through the courts, and have that person get their justice for the victim. So we're working for the victim, we're not working for our own glory. We're working for, on behalf of that person who was victimized by another individual. For example, psychology, simple thing. I was in a warrant squad in plain clothes in Midtown in the summer of probably 89 or something like that with my partner. I'm wearing a pair of jeans, a T-shirt, shield around my neck, unmarked car. We're, we're picking people up on felony warrants. Stuck in traffic on 54th Street at Broadway. We see traffic slowly moving down Broadway. All of a sudden, we see an interaction go on, engagement between a guy driving a truck and a cab driver. They're yelling at each other. It's a hot summer day. Windows are open. Cursing at each other, it, it, it becomes something more. Turns out that the driver of the cab jumps out, pops his trunk, pulls out a, a tire iron, and starts assaulting the driver of the truck who came out of the truck to confront him. Now, he's, he's, I mean, we're like 50 feet away, and I can see it, and I can see blood flying from the guy's head. So we run out of the car, leave our car, bolt towards the guy. The victim runs right towards a building my mother works in that I used to work in on Broadway. It's, it's like lunchtime. This guy runs in, the doorman closes the door and lets him in, and he's bleeding all over the floor. He's unconscious. The guy with the tire iron is locked outside trying to hit the, the windows to get in. I come upon him with my little five-shot chief, and I'm, I'm screaming, police don't move. He's agitated. He's really pissed. He wants to kill this guy, and he's big. He's like 6'4", 250, well-built guy, pissed off with a tire iron in his hand, and now I got 5,000 people right around me watching what's going on. So psychology. I'm like, put, put it down. Just put it down. Just put it down. I'm not talking about shooting him. I'm just telling him, put it down. Put it down. We can talk about this. He's like, you see what that guy did? I said, yeah, I did see what he did. But first thing, and we'll deal with that. First thing, I need you to put that down. In his mind, he thinks, okay, I got an ally. You're my ally. I said, we have to figure this out. I got to put you in cuffs. I'm going to do the same with him. Relax and work with me because I saw what happened. Okay. Meanwhile, all I did was see him hit him in the head and try to kill him with a tire iron. But I needed him to drop that because I wasn't going to put five rounds in him in front of 5,000 people on a hot summer day in Midtown and be okay with it. It's not something that I would have a, a, an easy time dealing with for the rest of my life because it's a momentary agitation on two people's parts. I just want this to end. I want to put you in cuffs, I want to get him an ambulance and draw up my case. That's all I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. he, he went for it. I put him in cuffs. I bring him inside, in, inside this little cubicle. We're calling for an ambulance. Nobody's available. There's no backup available, nothing. Nobody can get through traffic. Now he starts getting agitated. Now he realizes, hey, wait a minute. You conned me. You got me to put that thing down in cuffs. Now his anger is at me. I got this guy on the floor who's bleeding out. I'm trying to put a towel on his head that the doorman gave me. My mother walks down the stairs to go to lunch. And my mother's a kind, oh, hi, Danny. <laughs> and I, I, I took one look at her, I mouthed, go away. <laughs> go back upstairs. Like, get out of here. I don't want this guy to know that my mother works in this building. Like, she, she gets the hint. She walks back upstairs. But now this guy's pissed at me for hours. But that's okay because he redirected his anger at me and I had him in cuffs. Eventually, he calmed down. But the case was all about him. But that's a little piece of psychology that because I had a few years on the job, I wasn't just a rookie that was going to stand there shaking his gun. I'll kill you. I'll shoot you if you don't drop it. No, I was all about how do I get this guy to drop that? I need this guy to, to think I'm on his side. And sometimes that's what cops do.
So Tom, where, based on what Dan is describing there, when does that flip? You know, you talk about as a rookie, you're like shaking, you're saying, you know, I've got this weapon trained on you. I'm going to put five rounds in you if you don't put that tire iron down. When, when does that flip where you can actually have enough peace of mind or you know, not peace of mind, but mental state where you can take charge of that situation without escalating it beyond where it should be. And then yeah, you, you know can... what? It, it depends on the person. I mean, no one, no one's the same, you know, and then the, the job is not a cookie cutter. Like, all right, once you get this amount of time on the job, you'll be able to do this. It's not that it's, it's a DNA makeup. It's your background. It's your personality. It's your, you know, what you can, you know, when you're a rookie, you try to be a sponge, you know, like, like one of the things I did and actually a suggestion from my dad, who was a retired NYPD detective for years in the city. I took one thing of everyone that I worked with that I liked. If I was working with a guy I never knew, you know, I didn't know because I was a rookie and you were in the car for the night, observing one thing he did and then just kind of put it in my Rolodex, you know, and watch, you know, the biggest thing I get asked all the time, if I, if I speak it at a college or the academy or whatever, what's the best, what's the best advice you can give, you know, to a rookie, watch and listen and grasp what your, you know, acknowledge experience, you know, you see it, understand and just watch and listen how things are done. You know, Dan and I, you know, weren't always you know okay confident okay i can go in i'll I'll flip this guy you know it takes years to get to that and it takes a multitude of places that you end up working different areas that's the best thing about the nypd the vast amount of different places you can work narcotics gang unit robbery jttf major case you know the avenues are are vast but you need to grasp certain things from those experiences because Dan will say, you know, the King of Clubs case with him and and other cases, there's always that one case that you need to take everything you've learned and everything you know and put it into that case or that interview. And that's how important it is. And that's when you know, okay, I got this. And that's a great feeling when you, when you have, when you're at that point in your career where you're confident that you can, you can take that on. Uh, it's awesome. By the way, just kind of dating all of us, I think that when you said, you know, put it, put that into your Rolodex. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a few people I imagine that are oh, watching man. and listening to this, that they're like Rolodex. What the hell is a Rolodex? Heck, I've, I've already referenced a beeper in a phone booth in this conversation. So yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh my God. That's so true. All right. Uh, your notes app on your phone. Has that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, by the way, if you, um, so I don't know if you guys can see this, but for my birthday last year, <laughs> my, uh, my kids bought me this old lives matter glass <laughs> that, um, it's great. yeah, yeah. They're, uh, they're in on it too. So they, mm-hmm. they're all about hammering dad on uh, the gray hair that I've got here. Of course, most of it's from them, but you know, yeah. they, they don't care about that, but <laughs> No, uh, so just so everybody knows, a Rolodex is when you used to get a business card or somebody's information, you put it on a card and then it would go on a little wheel and you could flip it around and it was all alphabetized and, yeah. or, mm-hmm. or however you did your, your, uh, categorization there. And so that's <laughs> funny. Yeah. yeah we've just got that. notes on your phone and geez, man, I mean, today's world, you probably have a video for every little Rolodex card that you used to have. So right. It's, uh, boy, the world's certainly changed. I mean, Dan, even thinking about, you know, some of that information that you were talking about, I'm like, you know, imagine tracking those Chinese guys down with the cell technology that we have now, you know, you could, you could pinpoint their exact location within minutes, mm-hmm. you know, just if, if the, even a burner phone, you know, if you have the number, you can track that thing. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, the ability to solve crime and, you know, and like what I do with DNA, man, I can, I, I can provide you guys profiles that you would just, it, it just blow your mind. So right. technology is certainly improving and hopefully the, the case clearances improves with it. But, mm-hmm. you know, back to kind of 
just the the human nature that we were talking about earlier. It's like I don't think that's ever going to change. It's it's just one of those things that people are just the carnal nature of people and opportunities are going to always come come about. I think criminals will continue to figure out new ways to scam other people. I, I actually just did a podcast on what's called sextortion. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that, mm-hmm. you know, where they're, they'll get, especially the teenagers to um, take pictures of themselves and send it to somebody they think is just another teenager, but it's in reality a scammer. And then they start using that to basically blackmail the the child into t- sending more pictures and then eventually money. And then, but it's such, just such a sick practice when you think about it mm-hmm. that you're like, you know, they, these people are just taking advantage of the naivety of, of teenagers. And, and eventually a lot of times the, the teenager gets so bad that they either run out of money and they get completely hopeless. And, but the, the suicide rate from that is yeah. just extraordinary. And it's like, you, you completely destroy people's lives without even thinking twice about it. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to kill them to, to really destroy their lives. So a couple of things, you know, very clearly as a cop and a detective, if you do a career of this, one is that evil does exist in the world. There's lots of it and it comes in different shapes and forms and not everybody looks evil on the outside. There's plenty of evil in the world. Second is that evil is clever. True evil is very clever and can fool you and fake you. Uh, you understand that there are three types of people, that there are sheeps, that there are wolves, and sheepdogs. We're the sheepdogs. Sheeps doesn't mean you're a bad person. It means you go about your life. Most people are sheep. But the wolves, the predators who feed on them, are absolutely there. And a simple case of this can be, I remember being a young cop, living in Queens and taking the subway into Manhattan, which we called the city, you know just because it was easier than driving in and stuff. If I was going to go to some kind of an event, a hockey game, whatever it was, it was just easier to take the subway. I was right there. I get in the subway, stand in the car, and I always stood. I'd be standing in the corner, holding on to the uh, little arm, hand rest, and I would watch the car. Now, we always had a carry. Off duty in the city, you always had to carry a gun and shield because you're technically on duty at all times. If something happens, you have to do something. You're a sworn officer. You can't ignore a rape, rape or a robbery. You have to do something. So I'm standing there and I'm watching and being a young cop and being aggressive. I'm, I'm half wishing something would happen just because I'm like, <laughs> this would be fun, you know, exciting. So I'm standing there and I watch people get on a car, get off, get on. And most people do what New Yorkers do, which is they pay attention to their own little zone. They look, they got their headphones in back in the time, Walkman. Let's go back to the 80s and talk Walkmans. And they're just paying attention to their own little world. Then all of a sudden, one or two guys get on the subway car and they're looking around. And you can just tell they have to a cop. It, it comes screaming out of them. This is a perp. And they're looking at everybody. They're looking for an opportunity, an open chain, a bag that's unlocked, some kind of opportunity. And I'll watch them because my eyes are going around. And at one point, our eyes meet. And they look at me and I look at them and I don't turn away. And then they look back and they realize, oh, OK, he's a cop. They know right away and I know who they are. It's 75 people in that subway car and this little a human drama is going on between me and these two perps, and nobody knows except me and these two perps. And they will undoubtedly, every time, get off at the next stop, but make sure they walk past me and go, hey, do an officer. And I would go, get out of here, beat it. And they get off the train. I can't tell you how many times that happened. That's because our job is to watch for the predators, to watch for the evil, so the rest of the world can live their life. And you also understand that people, even unless you're dealing with a pure sociopath, this is really, detectives have to learn this. A person who's done something heinous that is not necessarily how they live their life, or even if it is, it's really bad. When you bring them in, they're under so much internal stress trying to hold on to their well-rehearsed lie and trying not to let it out because they want to let it out. They want to relieve themselves of what happened and why they did it. It can be that they killed their girlfriend because they were in an emotional state, whatever it was. They don't want to let you know, but there you can see them. If you, if you take your time and slow it down and talk, they physically start shaking. It's so much pressure and stress. And if you can get them to trust you, and if you can get them to believe that you understand them and that they're not a bad person, 
they will open up to you. And when they open up to you, what do they do, Tom? Put them in a cell mm -hmm. and they Take fall asleep. Sleep. They fall asleep because the relief of the pressure and stress was so enormous that their body passes out. And then when they wake up and meet their defense attorney in court, a new level of stress begins, which is the defense attorney says, you said what? <laughs> <laughs> Did they read you your rights and, and to tell you? It, the funniest thing is you have the right to remain silent, but not the ability. I'm <laughs> telling you to shut up. The Supreme yeah. Court has told me I have to tell you to shut your mouth, but you're going to talk to me because you're stupid, because you think you can get away with it and you mm -hmm. think you can con me. And that that was I, I still laugh at how many people I read that to who go, I know my rights. Yep, I want to talk. There's an attorney somewhere going, shut up, duct tape, don't say anything. But yeah. that's human nature. When you understand to understand how to be a good cop and detective is to have to understand human motivation, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, all that good stuff. And a desire to be clean of something. And if they see that they can be clean, they have a, a little glimmer of hope. They will cooperate and they will fall right into it. And it's a trap. Right. It's a yeah. manipulation. But it's a game we're allowed to play. And we have to play on behalf of victims. That, that, that is so interesting to me. Because, you know, if you think about how intellectually and physically and emotionally, you know, as human beings, we're such complex creatures and we're all tied in here together, but how much an emotional tired will affect you physically, you know? And that's, I, I, I think you're spot on Dan where, you know, that I think most people, unless they're so jaded, like those Chinese guys you were talking about and unless, you know, MS 13, I think are the kind of the same breed where they're so deep into it. They've been so ingrained into the level of violence and, uh, inhumane acts and things like that. But I think 99% of humanity out there are good people. Mm -hmm. And when they commit a crime like that, it's yeah. just, they, they're just having the ultimate bad day and whatever way they lashed out, I, I don't think that's natural for them. And so when they have that kind of act that's on their shoulders it's like a it's like literally you know atlas holding up the world and the weight of it i think is so immense and whether it's psychological or emotional whatever it is that they like you said they want to get rid of it they they want to be able to confess and and tell somebody and not in a braggart way but just in a in a way that just it actually expunges them and whether that you know, the consequences of, of telling somebody that obviously is less than the, you know, releasing that burden. And I, I just think, yeah, you know, you know, it's like, it's like the little boy that, that steals, you know, the cookie out of the cookie jar after his mom told him not to most of the time he, you know, when it comes down to it, even at a young age, he's like, yeah, mom, I took it, you mm -hmm. know, just to, just to get right with, over, yep. with the other people around him. And so, that's just what I think. I think that's one of the things that you guys master, and it's critically important when you um, when you're interrogating somebody in order to to get that confession. Give you a, one of the most classic examples of somebody. It's called leaking in certain ways too, of somebody who was so desperate to not admit, but to get what he could out. Our good friend O.J. Simpson, who just passed away who wrote that incredibly misguided book, If I Did It, where he talks about how if he had done it, it would have went this way, and he thinks it went that way. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a confession book. The whole book is a confession yeah. without being a confession. He tried to walk that line. He was so desperate to, to get it out, mm -hmm. he figured he'd, Right under the guise of, well, if I did it, this is what I would. But he did. <laughs> Everybody knows yeah. he did it. I, if you've ever read that book and you want to read delusion, self-denial, yet the desire to get it out at the same time, that confliction is all through that book. Oh, that's, yeah, yesterday, well, you couldn't read anything else other than O.J. Simpson. And that was, that was one of those wild things that everybody, I don't know, what, what an inch, I, I can't think of anybody else that was is remotely close to his experience level because, you know, how many people are were were trying to defend him 
And at the same time, he's like living a lie that he knows he's living it, that mm -hmm. he's guilty. And yet because of the court system, you know, being lenient on his celebrity status and everything else, he, he knows he was, uh, he should be in prison, but instead he's out playing golf, you know, and I don't know. What, what do you think about that, Tom? That, that's a, I think that's a really interesting subject to, to delve into. Yeah, probably in the history of, of crimes, there there's not going to be more evidence against one individual than there was against him. But, you know, he had a defense team that took advantage of what they had. They spun it in a way that helped him, which is their job. I give them that, you know, no, yeah. hey, everyone knows he's guilty. Got it. I'm just, just looking at it from a trial and courtroom presence. You know, they just spun everything they could into a doubtful thought. And that's what got him off. You know, the, the glove, the, you know, whatever they could come up with, they spun it. But, you know, I remember that so vividly in watching the trial and you're sitting there going, you know, from coming from my perspective as a detective, going, there's no way he's, he's not guilty. You know, between yeah. the blood, the DNA, his rage, you know, that he would have the cut on his hand that he, he broke on a glass in a, in a hotel, you know, airport. It's just none of it made sense. And, you know, I, I always say this. Things come full circle at some point in life. It may take a while. You know, it may take years. It may take decades. But at some point, evil gets taken care of. You know, and, you know, he got locked up for the robbery. He got cancer. You know, it's things happen. You know, the, the man upstairs kind of has a Rolodex himself <laughs> mm -hmm. and kind of goes through it with, oh, OJ. OK, you know, we're just going to let him go through this for a while. But Dan's right. I mean, that, that book was such a, you know, opening up of, of what he did and what a horrific crime in and of itself, you know, not only the yeah. crime itself, but the mother of his children and yeah. then some poor guy who just happened to be there, you know, and then to laugh about it. And then you had people backing him up, interviewing him and laughing about it, it was it was a horrific time. Yeah. And, you know, the, one of the most interesting things from a detective's point of view is and Tom and I have talked about this. He gets called. Your, your ex-wife was just brutally murdered in the home or in front of the home where your kids were. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm getting on a plane right now. No, your wife is dead. Your wife is dead. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm getting on a plane. He never asked how. Mm -hmm. The detectives noted they were like, how? He, he never asked? That's the first. What the hell happened? Right? He never asked it. Second thing about him that I find... Incredibly fascinating. His defense team, of course, he builds the dream team and they, they attack the DNA because it's still reasonably new technology and they can confuse the jury. Mm -hmm. Forget about the fact that the jury, because they only spent like a, a lunch hour debating all this evidence, was obviously intent on doing what they were going to do from the beginning. Yeah. The When you're a, a defense attorney and you have a rock solid case against you, you don't attack the case, you attack the detectives and the cops. Mm -hmm. When you have a case that has the slightest bit of a hole, you attack the case. In this case, they did everything they could to attack the cops because the case was too strong. Mm -hmm. They had to say, well, the evidence wasn't handled properly and Mark Furman's a racist, and so he planted the glove. So that's why they spun those crazy theories because it's to dra draw attention away from the fact that there's so much evidence that this guy did this. So in your, in your experience, when something like that happens, like particularly with one of your cases, typically does the prosecutor pick up on that and work, work then to, you know, defend against their attack? If that makes sense, you know, if, if the case is solid and they start attacking the methods as opposed to the actual evidence, are, are prosecutors typically smart enough to you know, to alter their, their strategy and then uh, yeah, the, the present talented, it in a different way. Yeah. The talented ones. Sure. The experienced ones, you know, 
prosecutors, detectives, experience, all kind of comes together at some point, you know, when it comes to a trial. And, you know, the, the bad part about the O.J. Simpson trial is Marsha Clark and, and Chris Dow were not the two best people in that office. And that's been noted. That's factual. They were not the most experienced. They were not the most revered, but they were chosen for specific reasons and which failed them. Mm -hmm. You know, there were, you know, talking to people who were involved, like Barry, Dan, you know, mm -hmm. there were much more experienced DAs in that office that, that should have been assigned to that case that weren't. But we've had numerous discussions with DAs when you start kind of game planning what the trial may be like. Hey, mm -hmm. if this comes up, we're going to go this way. If this comes up, make sure you say this. You know, talented DAs who who were real trial driven would always had the talent to kind of foresee defense attorneys. Hey, he's mm -hmm. going to say this. Make sure you bring this out in your testimony. You know, that, and it was like, okay, good. You know, so you had a note of it and sure as hell, you'd have a DA go, oh, you know, something you go click and you'd lay it out and give them nowhere to go. You know, and those were, those were the ones that were, that were a pleasure to work with that when, when you saw those names on the notifications and you went, okay, good. Yeah. I'm working <laughs> with a DA. Yeah. Okay. They have this case. And those are, you know, it's a small, it's a small group, you know, just like detectives who wants, who wants who to work on a certain case? Mm -hmm. Who, what DA you want in a certain trial? That was, and, they, and they know detectives too. They know, yeah. like, I'll go to trial with Tom Smith because he's great on the stand. He brings good evidence. He makes great reports. I'll go to trial with him. And there's some people that they're like a little less apt to go to trial with. And they'll tell you that. They'll admit it. They're like, well, this guy, he's not so great on the stand. He's got, I've had some issues in the past. They're careful. Mm -hmm. They don't want to waste the state's money going up with a case that, that might fall apart because of right. some hole. But also, one of the things that Tom and I have talked about this, once you get enough experience testifying, and when you work as many cases and, and many arrests we made throughout our careers, you get pretty comfortable in a courtroom. And you learn how to do this. Listen to the question, turn to the jury, mm -hmm. find one or two people who are going to catch your eyes and speak directly to them. And before long, they're all nodding. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And defense attorneys hate that. Uh, They'll walk over to the other side of the courtroom and try to get you to pay attention to them. And I'll be like, OK, I got a swivel chair. I heard your question. I'm turning. I'm facing the jury and I'm answering. And when you when you answer plain, honest, you nod your head or you make expressions. Yeah, we screwed that up. Yeah. And you can see them go. Hmm. When you do that, you've got the jury. The yeah, jury yeah. thinks you're credible. One. When you admit a mistake. When you admit a mistake, say, yeah, screw that up. That was not a good day. This is what happened. Defense attorneys hate that because they want you to just act like you never make a mistake. You know, yeah. one of the best stories real quick, again, with my dad, you know, who, who did it all in the NYPD in this 50s, 60s and 70s when New York was out of control. I had a case one time that we locked this kid up with a a actual Uzi with armor plating, armor piercing rounds in it. Foot chase, locked them up, got them, and now the trial. And the defense attorney was a major pain. His name was Rudy King. I'll never forget him. He would just go off on tangents and yell, and he was a pain to deal with. And I remember I was going on the stand the next day, and I was telling my dad, who I talked to all the time about everything when I was on the job and he was alive. And he goes, oh, what's he like? So I would tell him, he goes, okay, you want to know how to deal with him? I'm like, yeah, tell me. He goes, when you're sitting up on the stand, ask him to repeat every question he asks you. Yes. I go, what? He goes, everything he asks you, you don't understand it, and can you repeat it? I said, <laughs> okay, you got it. So the next day, I'm up on the stand, and he's yelling about something, and I just calmly looked at him and went, can you repeat that question? And he would lose track of the question. He didn't even remember yeah. the question. And he, you know, withdrawn and come up with something else. And I go, I can't hear you. Can you repeat that? And I drove this guy bananas <laughs> for almost three days. And we ended up, you know, convicted him and he went away for a long time, you know. But, you know, that's just part of it. You know, when, like Dan said, when you get the experience, testifying's fun. You know, you can have, you can have a good time testifying. 
especially if you're confident, if you know you did everything right, or even Dan said, you know, if it comes up that something went wrong, you admit it. You know, mm -hmm. you're a human being and, and juries like that. Juries don't like robots. You know, right. they like, you yeah. know, humans like, hey, yeah, I, we goofed that up. We should have wrote this. We didn't do this. We didn't cover it, whatever. And the truth's always going to be better because once you once you slip, you're done. You're not going to be able to to get back on track if you make something up or embellish about something or or yeah, whatever. Expand, yeah. So Especially another if the thing is actually um, catches on to that. Mm -hmm. You know, then then they're going to just exploit it. But so defense yeah. attorneys have their tactics, right? One of them is yelling. They try to get you upset. They want to get you emotional. They want to get you defensive. They want you to go back and forth with them really quick. All this stuff, and you have to learn to be patient. And I had a defense attorney one time who was screaming at me from like five feet away, trying to get me to be upset. And I just sat there, and at one point, I just turned. I looked at the judge. And I said, Your Honor, I, I apologize. I have a hearing condition where when somebody yells, all I hear is static. I'm sorry. I can't understand the counselor's questions. The judge looked at him and said, Counselor, speak in a normal tone, please. Mm -hmm. Destroyed him. Mm -hmm. Took the knees out from him. He had nowhere to go. That was his whole strategy, get me upset. And I just stayed calm. And I appealed to the judge, and a judge wants order in their courtroom. They certainly don't want going to record as being somebody who is antagonistic so, towards a witness because that's grounds for an appeal. And none of them want their cases on appeal right. or to overturned on appeal. So I just sat there calmly. Well, everybody's got their interrogation tactics and defense attorneys and oh, yeah. prosecutors, for that yeah. matter, just like detectives. You know, you yeah. all have a way of extracting information that you want. And, and you know what, you know what, Jared, the good defense attorneys at the end of the day, Dan, you had this happen to you, would come up to you outside the courtroom, go, hey, detective, great job. Mm -hmm. Good job. They know it's a game. They know it's, it's just, it's yeah. nothing personal. It has nothing to do with personalities. It's a game. And, and I, I had yeah. numerous, you know, defense attorneys like walk up, you pat you on the back, go, hey, that was good. Good job. You know, I'll see you again soon. So you suck, but, you know, you ruined right. my case. But, right. but well, yeah. but they, you know, if we believe in America and we believe in the right to counsel and we believe in that, all that stuff, which we believe fervently, we we, we swear to, to defend the Constitution. And that includes the rights of the accused, because mm -hmm. we could be accused one day, too. Mm -hmm. So you have a right to a robust, vigorous defense. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem explaining my actions and explaining my words that I've written and evidence. None of it. Just when you cross the line and start getting personal and get snippy and yelling and crazy and start theatrics and tactics, then it's time to, to, to show you what a calm professional can do. Right. And that's what the goal is as a cop is to be a calm professional deal in facts. Don't let them suck you into emotion. Yeah. Well, and, and it's interesting as, as you guys are just describing that, I, I was thinking there's a, there's another, defense attorney that I, I met on LinkedIn that I interviewed, geez, it's been a long time ago, but the one thing that he said out of that entire discussion that we had was he said, as a defense attorney, because, you know, there's, there's also that TV version of defense attorneys that, you know, they're, they're these scumbags that mm -hmm. all they want to do is get the bad guy, you know, to be able to walk free. And he said, you know, I don't view things that way. I view things as it's my job to make sure that the judge and the prosecution, which would include obviously the, the investigators, so you guys, but he said, my job is to make sure that the judge and the prosecution are doing their job. Mm -hmm. And as long as I do that to the best of my ability, then I, I don't, you know, the, the, the client... And the defendant, you know, none of that really matters. He mm -hmm. said, but he said, if, if the case is locked tight and the, and the investigators and the, the prosecution and the judge or the court actually does their job, then his client will be convicted. And he said, you know, I'm that's getting the, getting the defendant off. Isn't my job. It's just mm -hmm. my job is to make sure that everybody gets the fair trial. Yeah. So mm -hmm. And that's, I, 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 you know, I can live with that. And I, I think that again is like you said, Dan, if, if I ever get accused of something, especially if I didn't do it, then, you know, I want the type of defense that is going to be as robust as absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. So yep. yeah, there's, um, 
I, I think our entire justice system hinges on that. And when, when one part of that, regardless of which side of it breaks down, then our justice system doesn't work. But, you know, when, when all the pieces are in place and they're all, they're all functioning properly, I think it's the best, it's absolutely the best justice system in the world. And I can't think of anything that would be more fair than, you know, having a robust prosecution, but at the same time, a robust defense. And, Mm -hmm. and then the, the impartial judge in the middle of it saying, you know, keeping, keeping tabs on the two sides. And that's, you know, the theatrics that you always see on TV and everything else. uh, I I think that's just theatrics, you know, 99% of the time, I can't imagine that any uh, courtroom with the exception of things like the OJ Simpson trial, that's just not the norm. And so Mm -hmm. people having confidence in our justice system is, is critical for us to actually function as a society. You're right. It is. And, you know, I, can, I think I can speak to Tom and, and most, the vast majority of anybody who's ever worn a badge and a gun in this country and been given police powers of arrest. I would rather not arrest anybody my whole career than put the wrong person into prison for the rest of their life. Mm. And I have had frank discussions with prosecutors. You know what? I don't feel good about this. I don't have enough. Mm. I haven't made an arrest because I don't have enough. Or I remember one time specifically when I was in narcotics and Tom and I, you know, we were so busy. We made so many arrests. I remember one time I got called down years later for a trial on somebody who was missing forever. And it was one of maybe 15 felony arrests we made on one specific night when we were going out three to four nights a week in Brooklyn. And it was years ago. And I was looking through the arrest paperwork and for the life of me, couldn't remember the arrest. Now, that's not uncommon. You might grab one or two or three people at this location and then go to another one. I just didn't remember it. And I told the DA, look, I got to tell you, I'd love to testify on this case. I made the arrest. I did the paperwork. I don't remember it. I don't have my own individual recollections of the event. So do with that what you will. I can testify that I did this paperwork. I can testify that I was there because I did the paperwork. But I don't remember arresting him. I don't remember the events that led up to I'm sorry, I can't. I have it on paper, but I, he said, well, can you testify to the paper? Yeah, it, I'll do whatever you want, but I'm just telling you. I'm going to be very limited, and I will not say what I do not independently recall. I will not lie on this. That's not going to happen. And we had a real good talk about it, and he's like, you know what? Okay, we'll offer him some kind of a plea. Make it. I said, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. I don't right. want to be in that position. It's not right. right. And, and so th- that's the kind of thing you, you look for. I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just being honest with them. It's, it's called integrity. And cops have that far more than the public gives us credit for. We don't want the wrong person put away. No. That does nobody any good. It's all about getting the right person and getting them solid. Hey, one, one other thing that I want to hit before we, um, Tom, I, I really want to get to that Afghanistan story before we, before we end today. I mean, we, we got sidetracked, and I apologize for that. But It's okay. You know, before we do, when you think about the O.J. Simpson trial, now, granted, I mean, things are just different today. I mean, that was how many years ago was that? It was 94, 95, 94, right? Almost 30 years ago. Yeah. Jeez, almost 30 years. Wow. I, I, I remember the day that that was that Bronco was going down the freeway and they <laughs> basically I, I heard on the news yesterday that they said almost 100 million people watched that, you know, that Bronco going down the LA freeway at 40 miles an hour. Yep. And it's like, that was so riveting. It's like <laughs> <laughs> nothing else was happening other than this OJ, OJ Simpson driving down the freeway at 40 miles an hour for two hours. Yeah. That was like, I mean, you, in hindsight, you're kind of like, wow, well, that was a waste of two hours. But <laughs> during, during that trial, like you said, the, it seems that the, the, um, the jury had already made up their minds of what they were going to do. And, you know, in, in respect to how our judicial system works, you know, the, the prosecution's important, the judge is important, especially an impartial judge, the defense is important, but the jury is critical. And to me, the, the people that were sitting on that jury, I think they just absolutely failed and I, I think that was such a, a blight on our society as a whole, because to me, you know, 95, 
I, I don't think there was near the, the division and the racism or at least the claims of racism that it was, was brought out in that trial that it kind of, I, I don't know, a lot of dominoes fell that day, you know, when he was, when he was claimed not guilty. And what, as, as a detective, when you are interacting with juries, have you ever experienced that? Have you ever seen a jury and you're just like, you know what, no matter what I say, these guys have already made up their minds? Or do you think most people actually do what they're supposed to do and that's listen to the evidence, you know, be impartial and be objective about things and, you know, issue what they would want for themselves? Yeah, I, I think in my experience, I, I've had good juries, you know, that have, have listened and, you know, gone you know, I, I'm not sitting in the jury room, so I don't know the deliberations going on. But you get, you know, like, Dan, again, we just keep coming back to experience. And and when you look over a jury while you're talking, you kind of get a sense of if they're listening, if they care, if they're paying attention to what's going on. But you can kind of pick out ones that might you might have to talk to directly, you know, who are kind of wandering, you know, and others that are writing everything down you know, their notes. So you can get a sense while you're even sitting in the, in the witness box of, of who, who is, you know, who you might have to talk. Like Dan said, you turn your chair. There might be one or two that you have to look right in the eye and tell them what happened, you know, which, which I've done, Dan has done, but just going to OJ, I think two things I think affected that trial. One, there was a Rodney King hangover still in LA. That was a, that was a big thing that, that even though it was, Four years, two, two and a half years later, there was still a Rodney King LAPD hangover when that case came up and making it, having a celebrity in that position, I think made it worse. Uh, and then the other part, I think the juries were finding or looking for that reasonable doubt. Now, whether that happened on day one or day a hundred, as soon as those juries heard what they felt was a reasonable doubt, they tuned the rest of the trial out. They're like, nope, I don't believe that. I'm done. And didn't listen to anything else that happened over the course of that, of that trial and just had it in their mind. Nope, I don't believe that happened. And that might have been on day one and just blew, blew away the rest of the, the uh, trial. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that stands out that you think during the Simpson trial that was, that was the trigger that, those guys are like, oh, that's my reasonable doubt. Well, I think the uh, the whole theatrics with the glove gave them an opportunity to hang their hats on that, whether they wanted it or not. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. OJ putting his hand about as open like that as he possibly could into the glove. Everything about it was it, it was actually a yeah. pretty poor theatrics in many ways. But you know, oh, that was a Marsha Clark thing. I just I, uh, I look at that and I'm like, okay, first of all, he was wearing white gloves to you know that would add yeah you know yeah. additional space in there they allowed him to spread his hand and she should have brought in a brand new glove so mm -hmm. you know what this is the this is the bloody glove but you know blood is gonna like shrink it and and <laughs> anyway that it's like and johnny cochran told oj to stop taking his arthritis medicine so his hands got swollen mm -hmm. no and that was intentionally done. His yeah. knuckles, his knuckles got swollen from him not taking his medication that he was on for years. Yeah. And two, I think two or three days before they had planned on doing that, he told them to stop taking it. Oh, I'll bet his hands were just swollen like a bumps. Oh. Yep. Yeah. So you think that was probably the key moment? It could have been. If you're looking for something to hang your hat on to justify your lack of desire to convict somebody that would have been a good one because you could mm -hmm. go back to your to your friends and family and life and say see it couldn't have been him it wasn't the glove yeah. Yeah. whoever had that glove on killed him and it, it didn't fit him right i mean early on like you know jared you with, with the dna part you know they had one video early of one crime scene detective analyst whoever it was stepping over the yellow tape without booties on that was it boom look 
They contaminated yeah. the, the, you know, he didn't, yeah. he had just his right, his sneakers on, you know, and they jumped all over that. They didn't even know who that person was, but look, someone yeah. stepped over the crime scene without, you know, their protected booties on their, their shoes. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's that contaminated. Could have been, that it could have been, been a bunch of things that, that yeah. like you said, Jared triggered it. Oh, that, that's interesting because there was a case in uh, the Boise area that they used our system, our, our MVAC to collect DNA from, I think this case is back from like the sixties or no, not the sixties, probably the seventies. So, you know, approaching 40, 50 years old and they got DNA from it and it all matched the suspect and everything. But there's one picture of the detectives are holding up this evidence with their bare hands. Mm -hmm. And they're like, doesn't matter. We can't use it because the, the fact that that picture exists, the defense is going to bring it out. And then any um, DNA evidence that we present is going to just get destroyed based on that one picture. So yeah. crazy. Interesting. It's crazy. Crazy. Yeah, you got you got to go to Afghanistan now. I got to tell you this guy's story. Yeah. All right, Tom. Here's your your moment, man. This is a, <laughs> your your entire <laughs> life is accumulating right here to tell this story. Well, well, let me just let me just preface it by saying this: very few indeed, if ever, is the local cop from anywhere that gets involved in the kind of stuff that, as a member of the Joint Terrorism Task Force, cops can. And Tom specifically did. And not just get involved in it, but handle it the way he did. And I want, he'll tell the story, but, you know, I was kind of a need to know basis. And uh, I had retired and I lost my clearances. And Tom was involved in this. And it wasn't until, you know, a long time after that I heard the story and I was blown away by, you did what <laughs> kind of thing? And uh, so this story is, this is not your typical cop. I mean, there are special operators and CIA people around the world and SEAL. Navy SEALs, who have these kind of stories because that's their world. But to start out swinging a nightstick on a foot post in Harlem, and then 20 years later, you're involved in this, is almost close to almost unheard of ever for a local cop. So that's why this case is so remarkable. But anyway, take it away because I, I couldn't begin to encapsulate it. Well, the whole thing started in November of 2008. All I, I just came into work and I was actually in the middle of running a very large case at the time of this that I was wrapped up in and, and all over the country and the world and not home as it was because of this one case I was running and came into work and our supervisory special agent pulled me into his office. He said, hey, a New York Times reporter just got kidnapped in Kabul, outside of Kabul in Afghanistan. You need to run this with Jim, another guy on the team. So I went, okay, what do you want me to do with, you know, and then I named the case that I was running. He goes, you have a problem putting that on hold. We got to get this guy. We got to work this case and get him home and you have to do it. Okay, no problem. You know, so I have to now just re-engage my brain into something I was doing every minute of every day for a couple of years and put that to the side and start running on this. And Jim and I, you know, talked to the family and got all the information that New York Times reported while he was in Afghanistan to start writing a story, had got grabbed with his interpreter and his guide out of, in, out of a car by Al Qaeda affiliated group called the Haqqani Network, who was known for kidnappings. Uh, they were very well known for that. So we heard this, we knew the network that was involved in it. And, you know, now we have to have a game plan. And again, like Dan said, this isn't the normal thing. So as I said earlier in your show, Jared, you know, you get these cases that everything you got over your entire career has to get thrown into one basket. And this was it. You know, I have a U.S. citizen's life in my hands that can go wrong at any moment. You know, and he could be on Al Jazeera, you know, in the next hour. So it's working quick. It was working at a absolute rate that I liked because I'm just wired that way. You know, I was comfortable with the, with the tempo of it, of just nonstop go, go, go. And Dan, Jim and I came up with a plan that he was going to head to Afghanistan first and get things set up there. We had to be on the ground. We had to be there with, 
the intel community there, the military, and everyone else that was on the ground at the embassy uh, and get the firsthand accounts of what was going on. So it was my job to stay back for a couple of months and get everyone involved we needed on one page. And that was coordinating the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, the military. I had to get all these groups together to have points of contact and, and everyone under kind of one roof to run all the information we were getting at this time, which took a lot. But again, it was not really thinking about it. Just, hey, this has to get done. Not the, not the enormity of it. Just a matter of day, day by day doing what we needed to do. And we got, you know, the groups together and we were getting really good intel and NSA coverage and agency reporting was really, really good. So that went on for a certain amount of time, but we didn't, we weren't getting any real firsthand intel of where he was, or even if he was still alive, you know, we were getting reporting from the bad guys. Yeah, he's fine. We got him, but that doesn't mean anything. So it was my turn to head to Afghanistan and it was going to be somewhere in the vicinity of a three month hit that I was going to be there. So actually I wasn't, I get asked this a lot, like, Hey, you're a New York city detective. What the hell are you, what are you going to do in Afghanistan? And I didn't really look at it that way. I, I said, you know, I have to look at this as just a crime and I'm going to investigate a crime. I was comfortable with my tactics and, and what I was done. So I wasn't like fearful to go there. My, my anxiety was getting it done, you know, not where I was going. If that makes any sense, I just, I really didn't put any thought into where I was going. So on the plane over there, I actually sat, you know, sitting there and I said, okay, now it's my game. Now, now the ball's in my court. I have to play this the way I want to, regardless kind of what, what, if anything, Jim has done. And Jim and I kind of overlapped and he was there for a certain amount of time and we shared notes and got, contacts in common that I had. But once I got there, the one main thing that kind of broke it was I said, I need a source. I need a source on the ground that knows everything that's going on. You know, and I kind of had this narcotics thought in my head. That's what I would do in narcotics in the Bronx. So I'm going to do it here. And I got together with the agency and they had a list of kind of, okay, we got this guy, we got this guy. And they were all kind of in the terrorism realm. And I said to him, I don't want a terrorist. I don't trust terrorists. I want a criminal. Who's the worst criminal you have in this country? That's who I want to talk to because I'll trust a criminal. I don't trust terrorists. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I can trust a criminal because I know exactly what I'm going to say to him. So it got worked out and I got hooked up with, I, I developed a source who was the number one heroin dealer in the country. He was John Gotti of Afghanistan and the number one heroin dealer that produced the heroin going around throughout the, the world. So I said, okay, perfect. I'm in. So they're like, all right, wait, <laughs> do you understand? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. No problem. And we got in touch with him. We met. I had to fly down to Kandahar, which is the southern part of Afghanistan. With now my partner, Jim had left. I got another guy, Jim. So it was Jimmy. <laughs> we, uh, we went down there and we met him. And he showed up in just like you would see in a movie, in his entourage of SUVs and the dirt's flying all over the place and this array of cars are coming. And he showed up and we talked. And me and him hit it off like it was great. Because I explained to him, I said, listen, I don't care what you're doing here. I don't care what your background is. I don't care. I'm not here for you. I could care less how much heroin you're dealing. I don't care. What I care about is finding this guy. And he went, okay, you're being truthful. I like that. We kind of fist bumped. He goes, okay, I understand. So that set the tone of anything I wanted, he got for me. And we did. And it drove the agency crazy because he hated the agency and he got along with me. So I had a blast going back to them, telling them we had lunch and we talked. And he doesn't do that with us. I go, because he doesn't like you. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I went to Dubai with him to visit his mother in the hospital. You know, and that's because I thought I felt that's where I had to be to get the complexity of this case 
to get what I needed, I had to be like that. And we ended up getting the first proof of life video, you know, out of, out of him. So we got video of, of him being alive, which was, which said everybody, you know, blood pressure went down a little bit and started breathing that he's actually alive. And we ended up getting two more and working, you know, while I was over there, like Dan said, when you're a detective or a cop walking on a corner by yourself, you know, you just want to make it through the night. And now here I am in Afghanistan working with a Navy SEAL team and the agency and a bunch of other people over there that don't even have names. So it ends up, you know, we worked out what we needed to. The source was a big help and we ended up getting them out you know, safely. It worked out. Everything that we were hoping for worked. We were able to get him out. That I can't get into even still. But the main thing was we got him home and driving him home from the airport when he finally arrived in New York and pulling up to his apartment. And he got out of the truck we had and he got out and kissed the sidewalk in front of his building. Made it all worthwhile. However, the length of time I was away from home, the couple of real close calls we had in Afghanistan, which were really hairy, one really in particular, it all made it worthwhile, you know, when he got home and then make it even more. I got a card from him and his wife a few months later in the mail that they were expecting their first child and thanking me for for helping out with, with making that happen. So you have these cases that are memorable. And, and like Dan said, <clears throat> I had a part in it. There were so many people working on this. You know, did I coordinate it a little? Yeah, okay. You know, but there were a lot of hands in this that, that, had, that did tremendous work. You know, and, and it's good. The NYPD, not sounding anything, but the NYPD is the NYPD. You know, and when you show up somewhere and you have that shield... It means a lot. You know, people look at it and go, okay, you know, I don't care what level I am in the agency. I'm going to listen to this guy. You know, so that helped. It wasn't, oh, you're a cop. I'm this. You know, you're going to listen to me. You know, even, even the guys on the teams were like, okay, what do you need? You know, where are we looking? What do we need to look for? You know, so that made everything much easier to work. There was no, all right, let me prove myself that I know what I'm doing. It was on the ground. You are who you are. Let's get going. So that made it a lot easier. But, you know, it was one of those cases I was I was happy to be involved with. It was an experience like no other being over there. And thankfully, it all worked out at the end. Wow. So a great case. But, Tom, I just got to ask, does your wife, Ange, have any idea that you were thanked for your part in helping his wife get pregnant? That can be taken a lot of different ways. You know, no, just, I you think know. I just read the. I think I just read the card to her. That was about it. Yeah, <laughs> or, you know what? We got questions here. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> thank you for helping my wife become pregnant. That's a weird card to get, but okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Hopefully, that's not framed on your wall, right? No. You know, it, it, t- <laughs> Tom gave you the Reader's Digest version of the case because, in the interest of time, but there are some instances in it. He talks about some hairy encounters, man. Yeah. I mean, the kind of stuff the average person would still be quaking in their boots years later. But yeah, amazing. Well, amazing being surrounded work. by a by a team of Navy SEALs probably helped. But no, it was, I, I, actually, that moment, no. I mean, listen, if, if you got five minutes, I'll, I'll I'll tell you the story real quick. I don't want to take up too yeah, much. Yeah, no, time. go ahead. We were coming back. We were coming back from a meeting. Me and Jimmy. Now, Jimmy was a former Ranger, great guy. We had an agreement. Just to give you a little background, we had a, a real brother agreement that under no circumstances were we going to be kidnapped. Mm. Under no circumstances. Now, not being a tough guy, I do not mean it like this. But if we happen to die in a hail of gunfire, so be it. No one's grabbing us you know, to do whatever they want to do to us. It's not happening. And we had a staunch agreement. That's what our deal was. So we're coming home. We're coming back, heading back to the embassy. And we make a turn around a corner and end up getting surrounded by about 10, 15 guys with AK-47s. They stop mm-hmm. the car. So we're armed. I have an M4 right between my legs. Jimmy's arm. You know, we're, we're, we're covered what we have. And the biggest part of that was we both were calm. 
So he's dealing with one guy that's screaming at him at the driver's side window. So it's getting to an uncomfortable point that nothing, you know, this isn't going well. So I took a real quick snapshot that no one was behind me on the passenger side. Everyone was kind of from the front of the truck on that side. So I put my back against the window, the door and the window so I could face Jimmy and see him and see the guy he's dealing with. And it got to a point where the guy reached into the car and grabbed the steering wheel. And I told Jimmy, nice and calm, I hit the safety off my M4, said, move your head. And all he did, he didn't say wait, nothing. All he did was lean back in his seat. And the guy saw that. And I started to raise my gun and he let go of the steering wheel. And I told Jimmy, hit it. He floored it. We ran over one guy. Sorry. I jumped in the back seat and kind of laid down in the back seat, waiting for them to start shooting at us. You know, and they didn't. And we got out of there. So while we're while we're driving away. <laughs> I yelled to Jimmy from the back seat. I guess we're not in the Bronx anymore. <laughs> yeah, wow. Let's not minimize the potential of violence in the Bronx. I'm just saying. It, oh, no, I know. Yeah. Yep. yeah. No, You'd get I, surrounded I, by guys with nine millimeters. Not yeah. That, yeah. That'd be the only difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, that's absolutely incredible. Man, we could just sit here and talk all day about yep. experiences like this. And, um, I just can't can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing some of your experiences. It's uh, it's amazing. Uh, you guys, my hats off to you. You know, not only are you you you've done your duty, and you know you served your, your NYPD in New York for you know a lot of years, did a lot of amazing things, but you're still doing it. So, you know, for those of you that are out there that have enjoyed this, make sure to go to Gold Shields and subscribe to their you guys are on youtube yep. i'm assuming you're on spotify and everything else yes we're so, on every audio channel some we don't even realize we're on so we're yeah. on every audio channel and we're on youtube and rumble yeah there you go so pretty much anywhere you can find the gold shields and listen to more of these these guys story definitely support them and man fantastic appreciate it guys Thank you Any, so much, uh, Jared. Yeah. All right. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you, Jared. Appreciate it. Oh, the you. pleasure is all mine. You guys, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you down the road. You all the best, it. brother. Thank you. God bless. Thanks for joining us. Your attention today brings us one step closer to exposing and eliminating the evil that brings crime to our communities. Hit subscribe and share this episode. Together, we will bring justice to every victim.